Hello, welcome to the Punk Debite for this very last week of March. It's amazing how fast time is flying by. I, I wanted to begin today with a conversation about a news story that actually um, Pete from uh, Sarah and Aliyah and Mike's section sent uh, an article from the news for, for this disease that is afflicting Ugandan children. And I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's become pretty Hollywoodized. So if you look at a lot of the, the news websites, you'll find things um, that talk about zombie children and whatnot. This is rawstory.com. And there's just a lot of um, talk that's been going around about these this disease that seems to turn children into zombies and they wander away and uh, do crazy things and um, some of the parents, there's one story in one of the the press articles that talks about a, a child who is gnawing at his, his restraints because the mother ties him up so it won't, he won't wander away. And it's, it, I started to think about this and, and how the similarities with our conversation of ergot. And uh, at this point, the CDCs do not know what's causing this disease. And it's interesting how it's become so Hollywoodized. Um, I encourage you to go and look at the actual CDC's website on this, and I'm bringing that up into the picture now, where you'll see a video um, that is takes a very different take on what is seems to be a neurological disorder or potentially caused by... Um, they don't know whether there is a microbial link in this disease or not, and there very well may be. Um, so it's a, a very interesting contrast between how the public perspective articles are treating the story versus how the CDCs are reporting on the story. And I just uh, I find it very interesting and very thought-provoking and maybe something that I know, actually I know, that several of you will want to check out and think about. So on that note, um, let's kick off a little look at our calendar and talk about upcoming events. And this week we are we're going to be doing Lab 19 for most of you and Lab 20. Now Craig and Katie will be going to Lab 21. Uh, it's great to think that Lab 19 is going to be a massive inoculation party. Basically, the students on that day are going to be thinking about inoculating lots of tests for their unknown. And we will not have a lecture that day, but it that makes for a great forum to make some really important announcements. For example to encourage your students to find the dichotomous keys online, the table um, for unknown identification that's online. Um, it also is a, a good time to begin to encourage them to get started on their own lab reports. The unknown report is a pretty beefy assignment, so if you can encourage them to get started on that report and begin making at least the tables for the report, that will really help them out when it comes time to assign that report, which um, will be due about a week and a half after Lab 20. So in Lab 20, there will be a lecture, but before I run into some lows and or some um, uh, updates on what will be going on in that lecture, let's first uh, review that it will be Aaron and Chelsea rather than Leslie there that will be taking on Open Lab for this Friday. So let me know if um, you need any help covering that, but um, help have fellow TAs come in if you do need help with getting coverage for that particular lab. Okay, great. So let's let's talk just a little bit about Lab 20 and run through the TA guidelines for that. Before you begin today, you'll want to check and make sure that there's good fresh staff aureus on the camp test so that students can who do have a gram positive catalase negative caucus and need to do that camp test can get that back there to that station and take care of that. Uh, also today is a, an important day to help students students with interpretation of tests because what I've realized more and more is that they're still learning what it means to make a very thorough and um, very descriptive observation of their data, their results. And, and some of them have started to do things like taking pictures of the results, which I really encourage. That's an awesome thing. Because a lot of times they'll just write down plus, minus, and they don't remember that that was maybe a test that was a little bit unusual in appearance. And, and they get to the point of identifying and they can't remember that it might have looked like it was orange instead of either red or yellow. So this is a time to go around and help them with some of that interpretation. And I have highlighted on your guidelines here a couple of those things that tend to be difficult. For example, in the lactose broth tubes, enterobacter sometimes looks orange instead of looking either yellow with, you know, that clear lactose fermentation or 
or just read. And so it's sometimes hard for the students to interpret that, even though it is a positive result, it may be a little bit difficult and you may need to help them. But also at the same time you're helping them interpret it, also get them in the habit of writing down their own observations so that they can help themselves when they get to the identification process. Another good example of that is that Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, while it looks very positive around single isolated colonies, will sometimes look negative where the growth is thick. So that one, again, it's positive, but it's um, maybe good for students to write down very, very descriptive observations of that test. In lecture today, you're going to be covering a couple of new tests. You'll be covering the CAMP test and the MRVP test. Um, and in some cases, I'll probably be doing that lecture. But if not, take a look at the guidelines as far as some a little bit of helpful extra side notes on those two tests. The students may be concerned about not getting their MRVP test back. And so you may want to go ahead and remind them that the MRVP test will take some extra time in the incubator in order to produce stable acids and to overcome the buffer that's in that that particular tube. Okay, so that's um, most of what we've got for Lab 20. I had forgotten to tell some of the lab sections to bring a cup for incubation with them. I'm going to send an email out as soon as I finish this puncty bite, just reminding everyone that they need to do that. So I think that helps a lot. Oh, in terms of the gram-positive unknowns, the gram-positive rods, they're going to need to have the hot plate going, so we want to keep an eye on that. Some of them may need both the hot plate with dry heat and the hot plate with steam heat, so we may need to keep two of those going, and a lot of times we'll do that in the room next door. I think that's all that I wanted to say uh, at this point about Lab 20, but Lab 21 will be the next thing on our on our plate to be taking on and for this week Craig and Katie will be the ones that will be doing that so just to bring up a quick reminder of what's going on in lab 21 some students will not have performed their unknown stains or their stains on their unknown gram positive rods so we may need to have those steam baths going again and the hot dry heat going again so we'll want to keep that in mind and kind of keep an eye on those and also in lab 21 um, we're going to be looking at the MRVP test being the lead off for the day. So make sure that when they come in, the very first thing that they do is get started with that MRVP test because it does take about 40 minutes for the VP part of things to turn. So go ahead and get them running on that. They can interpret the MR part right away. If they have a gram positive rod, once again, they're going to have to flood the starch side of their starch and spirit blue plate, and they can get that going prior to the lecture as well. Um, we'll be introducing in the lecture the simon citrate test as well as a starch and spirit blue test for the first time. And so it'll be nice to be able to go um, to those tests that they've already seen and help them interpret them based on the theory behind the test. There's not a lot of new action in Lab 21. And in fact, this is the day where you're going to want to assign the unknown report. So with uh, that unknown report, I'll bring up a calendar just briefly because I think what we'll want to do with that is have it be due a week and a half after Lab 21. So what that would be would be either the 11th or the 12th of April. And if we have it due on uh, those days, that also gives you a week and a half to turn it back around to get it to the students. However, it, it may be nice to get it to them prior, prior to taking to their practical exam. So I don't know. We can discuss this and see what would best work for each TA. Um, but if, if, we need, if we think we need to have them turn it in on the 9th or the 10th, we can do that as well if that would ease your congestion. But it, it, is, it does it make for a pretty quick turnaround for them after identifying the unknown to turning it in in Lab 23. So a quick other note I, I haven't mentioned lately, please remember to turn in your timesheets. Um, I have I know I have signed some of the timesheets, but I certainly haven't signed all of them. So just an FYI on that and make sure you're getting those in so that you can get paid for all of your, your effort. Okay, I think that's everything that I had on my mind to talk about this time. So I'm looking forward to the week ahead and I can't wait to see everybody and um, have a fantastic rest of your Sunday.